So I'm going to move on. I'm going to, of course, first, before we get started, I do need to uh, talk about uh, a little review because uh, we didn't do that last time. But I did want to review a little bit on some of the material that we did before, um, like the rise of the labor movement, populism, etc. So I'll go through and talk about that. Uh, first, talked about the you know the working conditions of the 1800s, uh, how bad it was, low wages, long hours. Uh, talked about some of the organizations that first formed. Yeah, yeah, the Ho Ho Molly Maguires that they had originally, also called the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Remember correctly, those are a bunch of Irish like coal miners that kind of um, organized mostly around the 1870s. And it was kind of violent, you know, and it was later stamped out. And so a lot of early labor organizations were violent uh, that, that came out. Um, then they had the Knights of Labor. That was the other one that was kind of famous. I want you to know about the Knights of Labor uh, was uh, developed by Uria S. Stevens. It was a labor union, if you remember correctly, uh, for all all workers. It was like one big union. Uh, no matter the race, sex, skill, unskilled, that's primarily what it was for. Uh, and uh, it didn't work out because of um, radicals that were in the party, maybe. Uh, and there was an incident called the Hay Market Square Affair, also called a riot, happened in Chicago, 1886, where they killed a bunch of people. And that left a lot of bad taste in people's mouth about you know unions. And so the Knights of Labor kind of collapsed after that. But uh, I think I told you that one of the things that a lot of these early labor unions kind of influenced was shorter work hours. Like a lot of, a lot of jobs start going eight hours a day. Uh, then they had the American Federation of Labor uh, founded by Samuel Gompers. Uh, AFL, of course, was considered one of the first major labor unions to divide people based on their skill. And so they created all these craft guild unions, right, uh, that basically – organized uh, uh, workers based on what they did for a living, pipe fitter, blacksmith, whatever. That's how they basically divided people. Then they had the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World. They were, they were kind of a radical, pro-socialist kind of uh, union. It was nicknamed the Wobblies, uh, of course. Uh, and they were founded by uh, men like um, Eugene Debs, who was a member of the American Socialist Party, and also William uh, Big Bill Hayward. Hay Haywood was in it too uh, as well. This was kind of like an anti-capitalist type union that they had out there. Um, so that, that that union wasn't very popular. It's still around, by the way, the Wobblies, along with the AFL, but it's not very popular because people don't really like socialism. Um, then they had the Grange, the Grange called the Patrons of Husbandry, etc., uh, was a, a farmer organization that was founded in the Midwest by Oliver Hudson Kelly. Uh, and this was an organization to, uh, where farmers could socialize, get educated, and develop kind of a farming community to help with like farming practices and techniques and things like that. Uh, about one to two million farmers were in it, by the way, at one point uh, in the 1870s. And they also farm cooperatives to work together uh, to help sell their products, buy farm equipment or rent farm equipment, and things like that uh, as well. They also opposed unfair railroad practices, which was a big problem they had, um, where a lot of the railroads would um, pay them, uh, would, would uh, force them to pay exorbitant costs to ship like their produce to market. Uh, because of the fact that the railroads had a policy of giving discounts to people that had a long haul versus a short haul, which was where you had to go a short distance, which farmers had mostly. And uh, there was a, like a court case called Munn versus Illinois, where the Supreme Court stepped in to try to regulate uh, railroads that were doing this, but nobody would listen to them. Uh, and so it led to the Interstate Commerce Act, 1887, and that forced basically railroads and other businesses to be regulated across like state lines and stuff like that. Also included a, um, I think I told you, Interstate Commerce Commission that looked into corruption and so on and can investigate people uh, for things like that. 
Uh, then we talked about the scarcity of money. That was a big problem, of course, in the 1800s. And there were some people that wanted paper money, you know, what they call greenbacks and all that. And so, yeah, people that joined the greenback party uh, and so on. And uh, then you had those that wanted silver, right? They wanted to, want, wanted the government to coin more silver, buy more silver. And, and, of course, the government withdrew a lot of silver in the 1870s. That was call, caused the crime of 73. 1878, they also passed the, the, Blaine, the Blaine Allison Act, by the way, in 1878. And um, it really failed because the government didn't really want to coin, coin silver. A lot of people thought silver was kind of causing like an economic depression because people want to be more on more on the more on the gold standard. So yeah, the Greenbacks were kind of part of a political party called the Greenback Party or Greenback Labor Party, uh, which really wasn't that successful. But it led to the rise of the populist movement uh, by the 1880s and 90s. So yeah, this happened next. Uh, there was a case where farmers ally, uh, formed alliances together so-called former alliances, which was more of a political movement rather than social or whatever. Uh, and it was like the early stage of the populist movement that started in the Midwest. Uh, a lot of them wanted regulation of the railroads, regulation of industries. Uh, they want a cheap currency, uh, paper money, silver, backing currency. And uh, it led to the populist party forming in the 1890s, 1891, 92, uh, roughly. They actually ran a uh, uh, person for, uh, they ran somebody for president, a presidential nominee named James B. Weaver. He ran an 1892 election, uh, but lost uh, when Grover Cleveland won 1892, a Democrat. Uh, a lot of people, of course, what happened after Cleveland came in, there was a depression that was caused by the Panic of 1893. Uh, and so Cleveland blamed the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. It was an act, I think, around 1890 uh, to try to get the government to basically buy more silver, coin more silver. A lot of people thought it caused the depressions in the 1890s. Um, and so it was a combination of that. And I think also uh, a lot of people think it was caused by uh, low tariffs as well, which a lot of the tariffs were later repealed in the 1890s. So they think that solved a lot of the money problems. And so, you know, the economy got better later, but it still became a major issue in the 1890s. And so they had the presidential election of 1896 that occurred. And the whole issue of that election was about the money issue, uh, whether we should be on the gold standard or cheap money backed by silver. And so Republicans were in favor of the gold standard. Democrats were in favor of cheap money and silver and all that. That was the big difference between the two political parties. They were pretty much kind of similar. I think there were tariff issues that were different too, but that was the big difference. And uh, William Jennings Bryan, who was very young, only 36, uh, became the Democratic nominee uh, because he pushed the idea uh, that going back on the gold standard uh, would be like crucifying everybody. Uh, so he became famous for the so-called cross of gold speech, which got him the nomination, but he lost to McKinley from Ohio, William McKinley. Uh, and William McKinley was backed up by big business. And William McKinley also had more money uh, than Brian. Even though McKinley, I told you, sat on his porch and, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like Joe Biden or something like that. So um, anyway... So that's kind of where we're at, you know, right now. Uh, but what's going to happen is like the ideas of populism are going to come in. Like it's going to basically take over all uh, the Democrats and the Republican parties, uh, you know, uh, and you're going to see the rise of progressivism come in. So that's the that's the one of the things we're going to be talking about today, mostly. And if I have any time, uh, I will uh, talk about. Uh, maybe the rise of imperialism. I think I think I should have maybe a few minutes, like at least just start on talking about the rise of imperialism uh, in this lecture uh, today. So um, let me go ahead and first talk about, you know, like what exactly was the progressive era. Uh, you can see the dates of it are usually 1890 uh, to, eight, uh, to 1890, about 1920. That's usually the time period of when the progressive era was about. 
Oh, like it says, it was a collection of different ideas and activities about how to fix the problems with America. Because at the time, America um, was, you know, just coming out of that period uh, where uh, we were had just finished uh, the West, uh, basically. Like we had just expanded. We're, you know, we're expanding the West. We're going westward uh, and all that. And but they're having all these corruption problems because of the Gilded Age. That we talked about. So all this stuff is kind of politics, social life, uh, and, and even in the economy, economy also as well. So uh, a lot of people want to put in like new ideas, and try to you know try to uh, fix things uh, in the country and all that. And um, there was this um, guy that I need to talk about, of course, real important. Uh, which was uh, Robert La Follette. I need to get into him. He's pretty important. Uh, Robert La Follette. Uh, they called him Fighting Bob. <laughs> they have heard of that. Uh, and he was the governor of uh, Wisconsin. He was elected in 1900. He was important because he helped to break the uh, back of um, the Republican Party machine that controlled Wisconsin, which was, I think, kind of corrupt at the time. And um, he came up with new ideas uh, you see there. Uh, where he supported the ideas that will be part of progressism later, direct primaries, referendum, initiative, which I'll talk about later what those are. I've got some slides on that uh, that I'll show you. And um, La Fala, you know, attacked a lot of the big businesses, railroads, uh, utility companies, and stuff like that. Uh, and he wanted those companies to be more regulated, uh, which is something that he started doing uh, in Wisconsin. So this became known as the so-called Wisconsin idea, uh, is what some people called it, uh, basically. And it actually was associated with the uh, universities, believe it or not, like in Wisconsin, like the University of Wisconsin was, I think, one of the first, in Madison, Madison, I think it is, Wisconsin, uh, where it's located. And they got involved. And so they used a lot of these state universities um, to try to regulate what's going on in the state. They even had state commissions that would regulate things, which a lot of these were from the universities uh, that were involved. So it soon gained national attention, you know, what they were doing in Wisconsin. And then it spread to other countries, Missouri, New York, California, throughout the United States. Uh, also, Wisconsin was one of the first to uh, start conservation of like their forests, things like that, like their wooded forests, things like that. And so you'll see that later throughout the United States, like Teddy Roosevelt takes that up and starts, you know, trying to conserve forests throughout the United States uh, and stuff like that. So Robert Fall is a pretty important guy. He later would run for president, by the way. It lost, of course, but he ran for president, I think, I want to say one or two times uh, at one point. That's who he is. Robert Flott, or Follett, kind of hard to say, uh, but of course he was known as Fighting Bob. Uh, there, you, there, you can see like some other things too about, um, you know, what what it was, you know, uh, the Wisconsin idea. Um, so it started by Wisconsin politics, but associated with, like I said, University of Wisconsin, Mad Madison, Madison was definitely involved in it. You can see all the ideas that they proposed, which we'll talk about a lot of these later uh, that we'll have. Well, I'll talk about some of the primary stuff they did, elections they did later, um, direct election of U.S. senators. Progressive income tax. I think we already talked about the income tax, I thought. I think we did. Or maybe we haven't. I don't know if we've done that one yet. Um, but anyway, um, uh, 16th Amendment, I believe. Yeah. And um, so so anyway, so and Rafal was, of course, a big supporter of that, you know, uh, overall with that. All right. Then they had something that's very famous with uh, the, um, you think about what happened with, uh, the progressive movie. Yeah, the muckrakers uh, that they had uh, overall. And uh, the muckrakers uh, was a term uh, that was coined by um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Well, he's the one that coined it originally sometime around 1906, which was actually a term which was um, kind of a derogatory term or mean term. term. Those guys are a bunch of muckrakers, what they're doing, uh, you know, uncovering all these problems in society. Uh, but, of course, they would find out later these kind of things were important, you know, 
uh, in trying to change society uh, and uncover problems in society uh, in general. So what exactly were muckrakers? Well, they're kind of like investigative journalists. Um, kind of like today, uh, people will investigate certain things that are going, going on that are corrupt, maybe in politics, uh, shady stuff in business and whatever else is kind of going on. But they're basically inves investigative journalists is what they were that uncovered corruption. Somebody would call it yellow journalism, but that was a little different. That was more like sensational type journalism, which they kind of do today still too as well. Uh, but like I said, Teddy Roosevelt was the one who originally coined it, but it was more of a negative term. But uh, later the muckrakers uh, took that term and they liked it. They loved it. Uh, it was kind of seen as a term that they took with pride. You know, and so and so these guys became really popular. Uh, these muckrakers, uh, like late nineties, eighteen nine, or suppose mostly early early nineteen hundreds is about when a lot of them were mostly doing a lot of the writing that they were doing. You know, investigative journalism. So here are some pictures of some of the people that were kind of involved in it. Uh, Jacob Rias. Upton Sinclair, uh, Ida Tarbell, those are the ones that were probably the most famous ones, especially uh, Upton Sinclair, which I'll get to a little later uh, about him. Uh, of course, uh, one of the most famous I want to talk about is Ida Tarbell. Uh, she, of course, um, was famous for a book she wrote called The History of the Standard Oil Company. It not only went into like, you know, the history of Standard Oil, uh, but it exposed a lot of Rockefeller, you know, John D. Rockefeller's unfair pra business practices he was doing, you know, to put people out of business. And, um, and so this book was kind of written to kind of take his company down because uh, he thought it was just like a corrupt company that was a monopoly or trust, you know, like we talked about before. Uh, and so uh, the actual, um, I think the, it was actually a series of articles she published, which eventually became a book. And uh, over time, what happened, if you know about the Standard Oil Company, it was later broken up in a Supreme Court case, I think in 1911. And I think because of the Sherman Antitrust Act, et cetera, uh, Standard Oil was broken up into like 30 something companies. And that's why, you know, we've got so many, different gas stations. You've got like Exxon and Texaco and Gulf and Shell, you know, and so on, Mobile, whatever. That's why they're all they're all broken up uh, because of what this lady did. I bet he wasn't happy about that lady. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So but that's basically this what that book was and why she was important. So she's definitely one of the most famous of the muckrakers uh, originally. Now, another one, too, um, is, um, I don't know if you heard of Lincoln, Lincoln Steffens. Uh, they call him Joseph Lincoln Steffens, Steffens uh, also as well. Uh, and uh, he's another one. Um, I think he was one of the earliest muckrakers back in the 1890s. I uh, worked as a reporter for various magazines like New York Evening Post. Uh, and, of course, he was later an editor for McClure's Magazine, where he published a lot of articles, uh, Steffens, uh, and um, his style of, of journalism is what led, they think, to muckraking. So he's the guy that kind of influenced it uh, overall. I mean, he wrote a series of articles that were eventually made into a book, which was called in 1904 later, The Shame of the Cities. Yeah, The Shame of the Cities is what it was called. Uh, and um, this book, basically what it did uh, was it uncovered a lot of the corruption uh, that was in the cities. Because uh, at the time in the 1890s, a lot of cities were very corrupt. Uh, politicians and uh, businesses were involved with the government, paying people off. So a lot of people had these um, special privileges within the government uh, due to corrupt people in the government. Uh, and um, 
Uh, Stefan said that the basic problems facing Americans was not the develop not the development of industrialism or businesses, small or large. The source of evil was privilege, the demand for special privileges from the government by corrupt or dishonest individuals. So that's basically what he said. He said this had to be controlled or, or abuses and corruption would result. So I think he had another, when there was some other thing he wrote too, um, I thought he had one that was another one that he had, Tweed Days um, in St. Louis. I think that was another article that was famous as well, talking about the corruption of St. Louis, um, you know, in Missouri. So all these cities, you know, were corrupt at the time and a lot of it needed to be cleaned up, you know, um, which I guess they've kind of done. But a lot of cities are still like that today, you know. I wouldn't say name names or whatever with cities, but there's a lot of cities out there that still have that problem with corruption uh, overall. All right. Um, then, of course, also um, another, another uh, court, probably the, one of the most famous later you've probably heard of is Upton Sinclair. He's very famous uh, as well. Uh, and uh, he had a famous book that was called The Jungle. You may have heard of it, published in 1906 uh, that came out. I think that's wh why maybe um, Teddy Rose was talking about muckraking and all that, muckrakers and negative name, maybe because of that book. I don't know. I think he read that book, Teddy Rose, but he was totally disgusted by it. I know, like some of the stuff it mentioned in there. And uh, anyway, um, Hopton Sinclair wrote this book, and what it did was it uncovered the unsanitary conditions of people working in the meat packing industry, mostly in Chicago, of course, which was like the center of the meat packing industry uh, overall. Uh, and um, anyway, he was talking about how, like, how the working conditions were awful, you know, terrible for the workers. Uh, they would have stuff fall into the food, you know, that shouldn't be there, roaches and rodents and oh, I got my finger cut off. Oh, no, where'd that go? Oh, I went in the food <laughs> somewhere, you know, just stuff like that going on, you know, you know so um, so just nasty stuff going on. And so later, uh, if you know what happened, it later led to the Food and Drug Administration, you know, being founded, which would be, I think I want to say in 1908, that's when it came out under Teddy Roosevelt, yeah, the Food and Drug Administration, to kind of regulate all these kind of things uh, that, you know, Sinclair's talking about in that book. So, yeah, The, the Jungle is probably one of the most famous books ever written. You know, that's a muckraking type. It was a novel that was written, you know, about that time. All right. Um, so, yeah, he's talking about the working conditions and issues right there. Yeah, FDA. Uh, also, the Pure Food and Drug Act was, was one thing I need to mention, too, about uh, that came out. Uh, which was part of the FDA because they had the FDA found it first, and the Pure Food and Drug Act. They had to start labeling, you know, what they put on the can, like what they're canning, whatever, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So all that kind of stuff uh, started regulating all these different um, industries for food and so on. Also, they think that the book influenced the decline of child labor, as he talked about. I guess children working in these meat packing industries and how bad it is. And so that was another thing that, you know, really, of course, um, led to the end of that as well. This, that same book. I think they made not a movies out of it. You saw that little, little thing right here, but they made new movies out of it, believe it or not, uh, the jungle. Uh, so early 1900s, I guess. So yeah, muckrakers, you know, have been around, you know, up through, the 20th century into now, we've, we've still got people, you know, writing books, you know, that are kind of, you know, muckraking stuff. Uh, like Ralph Nader, you know, uh, wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed about certain cars that weren't built right. Uh, an example, Ralph Nader's the reason why you wear a seatbelt. I don't know if you know that or not, but he wrote a book about that and said people ought to wear seatbelts, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, and so that's why you're wearing seatbelts because of him. Or if you do wear a seatbelt, you should wear a seatbelt. <laughs> um, and then um, 
Bob, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, if you know about them, they were kind of like investigative journalists. They helped uncover Nixon scandal with Watergate. Uh, and so um, Washington Post, I believe it was. Uh, and so that led to President Nixon, you know, resigning, stuff like that. And um, which one was it? I forget. Was it what, what, was it one of those um, online news or which was it, Breitbart, Breitbart, or I can't remember which one it was. It was one of those like news ones, a, uh, online news things they have now, but that was when it uncovered, it wasn't that, it wasn't Breitbart, it was some other one. I can't remember which one it was. It was that one where they uncovered the um, Clinton affair with uh, Monica Lewinsky. I forgot which one it was, though. Oh, I can't remember which one it was. Well, some, some online one did that, I know, that was famous for it. So anyway, uh, let's go ahead and move on and talk more about the progressive era. So yeah, the progressive era was famous for uh, doing a lot of these, um, it was a reaction to the Gilded Age, you can see there, uh, really took off in the 1900s uh, after all these muckrakers started uncovering all the corruption that they have uh, going on in government, society, business uh, in general. Uh, and so um, one of the big things that came out, you know, uh, with um, the progressive movement was political reforms. It's, it's one of the main things I am going to talk about today uh, is that. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of, made a lot of political changes uh, to the landscape uh, and so on. And um, a lot of them were educated. You see that, you know, you, you notice that right there. Um, a lot of the progressive reformers were educated. They went to college in general, like you're going to college uh, right now. I guess they don't have to be online like we're doing, but um, and then you had also the they think the reform movement went all the way back to the Greenback Party, Greenback you know Labor Party originally, then it went down to the Populist Party, and then now the Progressive. So it's kind of like this you know evolution of different movements that kind of started in the early, I guess around the 1870s really, and progressed up to the early 1900s. So. Uh, and so a lot of them want to, you know, return control of the government, the people, restore economic opportunities, correct injustice in American life, things like that. That's the goal of a lot of these progressives uh, and, of course, what they want to do uh, overall. Let me get into some of the reforms, of course, uh, that were involved with the progressive movement. Uh, of course, I've got a lot of things I could add on the screen for you. Uh, uh, of course, one of the first things that came out, which was really popular, was the Australian ballot. They call it the secret ballot uh, overall. And uh, that was a major step toward democratic government in this country. I don't know if you know that or not, but it was. Uh, and before that, like before like the 18, I think 90s or whatever it is, where they started using it, uh, most political parties would print their own ballots. So if you're a vote for Republican, they might have a certain color ballot, like red. And if you're voting for the Democrats, you might have a certain color, which is blue. So everybody knew who you're voting for. He's voting for the Democrat, you know, or Republican, you know, that kind of thing. So people got to know who you're voting for on uh, stuff like that. And so what happened was because of the, what all they were doing in Australia, um, they came up with the idea to print like who everybody on one ballot that's that's running for office. So you got five people. So you got three people running for president, whatever, whatever's on the ballot, I guess. They have them all listed, basically. Uh, and, um, and then it would be secretive. Nobody would know, you know, who's, you know, um, voting for what. You know, they have no idea, you know, so unless you told somebody, whatever. Uh, so that's basically what that was. And that was something that really uh, helped with, you know, uh, elections in general. Um, other ones, too, you see there, adoption of the initiative, referendum, and recall. What's the initiative? Uh, it's where voters introduce legislation for consideration to state lawmakers. So you got an idea for something. Uh, and so then the lawmakers would create a law specifically for some kind of issue uh, that the public needs, uh, of course, changes with. Uh, and so if it gets enough votes, that can create a bill. Uh, and then what happens is that bill 
could then go up for vote, like a referendum, where they have a plebiscite vote, yes or no, on a certain bill or amendment, uh, which is introduced in an election. A lot of times an amendment um, basically um, – a lot of times an amendment is something that they usually do. Like a constitutional amendment will be added, you know, uh, of course, later uh, and all of that. Uh, and um, that's something they still do today. Uh, then the recall, that's another thing that's very famous. Uh, that's also you've probably heard about. Although recalls are very rare. It's hard to get somebody recalled. I think there's talk about recalling different people I know today, but that's when uh, it enables voters to remove elected officials before their term expires. So you don't like a certain governor, president, whatever, mayor that's in power, you want to get rid of him. Uh, you have to get like a petition signed with at least 25% of the eligible voters uh, before you can hold a special recall election. It actually happened in California, I believe it was, with they heard of the Governor Gray Davis. I don't know if you remember that. It was around 2000, I think it was. Actually, no, 2003 is when it happened, excuse me, where he was recalled, recalled election, which was actually successful, very rare. That happened. You know who replaced him, huh? Otto Swalzadega. <laughs> of course, the came president, which he served like two terms, you know, uh, of course, in uh, California. <laughs> yeah, the governor. <laughs> he was a pretty good governor, I guess. Anyway, so basically that's what the recall was, uh, basically. <laughs> anyway, uh, then they got the direct election of the senators, uh, 17th Amendment, uh, of course, that came out uh, as well. That was where, you know, the, before that, the state would just, like the governor, whoever, would just nominate somebody that would basically be senator, which was often corrupt. Uh, now it's like a popular vote, uh, basically. So you got a better chance. Um, and so... That's what they do today. You know, pretty much all states, you know, do that uh, direct election of of uh, U.S. Center, U.S. senators. That's U.S. You know, federal government, not state. In the state, they do the same thing. They have a, also kind of a direct election too, um, also as well. Uh, we've talked about the Sixteenth Amendment already. That was the income tax or progressive income tax. I don't have that in there. That was another thing that a lot of the populace wanted, which will later develop around. I think it's around World War One when they bring in the income tax, which will be a little later. Uh, direct primary. That was another thing, too, um, as well, uh, with a lot of elections, which they do usually, you know, with the U.S. presidential election. That's where they have an election where a political party, like, say, Democrats, uh, Republicans, will have an election to choose who their candidate's going to be uh, for a general election coming up. Uh, and so that's something that they often do uh, in some states. So they're called direct primary uh, as a whole. So they had like a presidential primary like in Louisiana, you know, and I think in Louisiana, Trump won the Republican and then Biden won the Democrat. So kind of like that. Um, then, of course, they had the women's suffrage movement, too, uh, as well. The so-called 19th Amendment, uh, which would give women the right to vote eventually, which I think came out in 1919. That's when the amendment uh, came out, passed by Congress. And then um, it was, I think, eventually ratified by 1920. That was when it became legal. Um, 17th Amendment was, I think, was right before that uh, as well. Oh, one I miss, 17th, 19th. What about 18th Amendment? I'm missing an amendment there, right? That was another thing that was kind of part of the progressive movement, temperance movement. You've probably heard about you know what the temperance movement was? That was a movement to basically limit people from drinking alcohol, trying to ban it uh, and stuff like that uh, overall. Uh, and um, that was started by mostly women in the 1800s who were tired of their husbands coming home from the saloon drunk, that kind of deal. Uh, and uh, I guess wasn't doing them any good, keeping them like with a job or whatever. Um, and so uh, if you know about it, started all these uh, movements like the Anti-Saloon League, I think, was one of the first movements uh, that started uh, overall. Uh, and then um, eventually it gained enough speed where a lot of groups, like various Christian groups, joined up. 
Baptists, Mormons, Methodists, evangelical Christians, Quakers, a lot of these Christian groups wanted to ban alcohol. And so over time, there was also this guy named Billy Sunday. You ever heard of Billy Sunday? He was real big. And he, he basically uh, pushed a lot of the idea to get rid of alcohol. There was also World War I, and there was a shortage of grain, stuff like that. And so the 18th Amendment came out, and that eventually prohibited the sale of alcohol uh, to people. <laughs> and uh, man, uh, that was something. Uh, it's like so called like a great experiment, you know, is what it was. Uh, and uh, it really failed in the end. That was one of the progressive movements that didn't work uh, very well. Uh, and of course, it led to the Roaring Twenties and people drinking, and the mafia boomed, selling illegal liquor, bootleg liquor, and uh, stuff like that. But we'll get to that later, and we won't talk about that now. But that's something later uh, that we'll get into. So these are all some of the things of you know talking about uh, the progressive movement. So all these are in the slides if you want to go back uh, and look at them, uh, which are right here, Seventeenth Amendment, um, right there. Hey, actually, it's 1913 is when it was eventually ratified. Uh, you see right there, direct primary. I just taught Wisconsin was the first to do it. I tell you, Wisconsin idea. They were the first ones to have the direct primary, of course, that I'm talking about. Spelled election wrong. Oops, I'll fix that. But um, anyway, um, yeah, that taught the 19th Amendment, of course, which took years for women to get the right to vote. Uh, but women were actually already voting in some states. Wyoming, Utah, Colorado, and Idaho were the first states where women had a right to vote, uh, believe it or not. Uh, some of the Western states primarily, you know, uh, and then it, the idea spread the whole country, uh, basically. So that's definitely something um, that's important, you know, with um, with changes going on. There's the temperance movement, um, Oh, they had these signs like that. They were funny, but that lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. <laughs> you know, see so all these women that you know you couldn't go out with them, <laughs> take a date, <laughs> you know, court them or whatever if you drank alcohol, you know, and stuff like that. So anyway, so it's kind of stuff like that. Yeah, Maine was the first state to. Um, you know, prohibit alcohol. You still have like what they call dry counties, like in certain states, you know, where you can't buy alcohol for some reason, which all goes back to the temperance movement and prohibition. All right, now I need to go ahead and move on, uh, and I need to talk about. Uh, of course, we have a few minutes. I'll talk up just a few minutes. I don't have that much time today, but I'll go in and I'll just briefly talk about uh, U.S. imperialism because I want to put this lecture up so y'all can. Look at that review section uh, as well. Uh, and um, so, yeah, one thing that happened uh, that's very famous under um, William McKinley, uh, the United States started becoming like an imperial power, which is true, like in the late 1890s uh, and all of that. Uh, and um, really, if you look at it more or less, uh, one of the conflicts, well, I'll get to, which I'll get to later, not today, but one of the conflicts later that's big uh, in getting us into uh, imperialism, like in the world, modern imperialism anyway, uh, is the Spanish-American War, which occurs in 1898. That's definitely a major event uh, that really is important in why the U.S. got involved in imperialism. Uh, and uh, one of the things they had, well, there's a slide on that right there, if you want to look at that, but... Uh, one of the things that happened that that's very uh, famous uh, about um, imperialism is that they had this thing called new imperialism that came out, you know, about it in the 1800s. They had what they call old imperialism. That was where the old powers uh, like Britain and France and Spain and Portugal, uh, all these countries in Europe, the Dutch, I mentioned Britain and so on, but all these countries, France, I think was another one too, yeah, they were involved in developing colonies uh, throughout the world, like France, Britain, Spain, you know, at one point at colonies, like in the New World, uh, Latin America, um, you know, and so on. So that's what that was initially. Britain was in Australia, New Zealand, you know, early, early old imperialism type colonies from a long time ago. 
Then you had new imperialism, which was like mostly 1800s, uh, predominantly up to World War I. That was a period where it was like an extension of um, the uh, Industrial Revolution, where a lot of these industrialized countries wanted to find cheap mark, cheap labor, cheap natural resources, and new markets to sell their goods. And so they focused on areas of the world, uh, such as not just, you know, Europe or whatever, America, they wanted to go into Africa, Asia, Pacific, and take over these areas uh, and try to colonize them and make colonies out of them on stuff like that. So the British were the most famous with it. The British had colonies all over the world. Uh, and they used to say uh, that Britain, you know, if you know about it, uh, the sun never set in the British Empire. That was an old quote they used to say uh, about the British Empire. Their empire was just all over the world. Latin America, Pacific, Atlantic, uh, Africa, Asia, Pacific, you know, Australia, New Zealand, you know, pretty much. So they're all, all over the place. Um, and so, so yeah, new imperialism was kind of like, was like an extension of like the Industrial Revolution, you know, in a sense, uh, and all of that. And so Americans later wanted to get involved in that because all these other European countries were doing it. Japan was doing it, you know, and so on. So they wanted to get involved. Now, um, one of the first instances, of, I guess, where the United States kind of becomes an imperial power, if you want to call it that, uh, is the purchase of Alaska, <laughs> which happened in 1867. Uh, of course, known as Seward's Folly. Um, it's actually a typo on that, looks like it. Uh, and uh, actually, that was a typo, uh, which um, that should be. Uh, Seward's, uh, I have it twice in there, but it should be Seward's Folly, and then the other one it should be, uh, if you know about this, um, Seward's um, Ice Box, uh, is what some people called it uh, as well. Yeah, Seward's Ice Box. <laughs> and uh, they called it that because uh, of the fact that um, a lot of people believe when they bought this from the Russian Empire in 1867 that they all, all they were buying uh, was a bunch of icebergs, penguins and polar bears uh, up there. Uh, and we bought it for about seven, $7.2 million from them. Russia was trying to get rid of it because their empire is kind of declining a little bit after the Crimean War. They weren't doing so well. Uh, so you got, they sold it off, uh, basically. I think it was under Alexander, Emperor Alexander II sold it to us. Uh, he was the emperor at the time. And uh, William Seward was the Secretary of State under Andrew Johnson. So he's one who helped buy it, uh, basically. And, of course, what ends up happening, uh, if you know uh, about, you know, Alaska, we end up finding gold there. They had the Klondike Gold Rush, uh, which occurred, uh, I think, I want to say 1890s. Uh, that happened where they found gold around the Yukon River. And so that led, led to a lot of people wanting to go to Alaska. Uh, they find gold along that that river, the Yukon, uh, as well. And oil was later found uh, also in the early 1900s in Alaska. So Alaska proved to be profitable later. It is one of the largest states uh, in, well, in the you know, 50 states of the United States, along with Texas. So that's basically you know, what that was, the Seward's folly. But it's not a, not a folly anymore, um, as you know. Um, now, um, also, I don't, oh, Hawaii too. Yeah, that was a no. I guess I'll mention real briefly about, yeah, we also acquired Hawaii, uh, as well. We took that over, uh, as well, uh, cause Hawaii had a lot of sugar plantations, uh, also pineapple, uh, as well. And so the U.S. would acquire that too, uh, even though Hawaii was an independent monarchy, like a Polynesian type state. We would take it over, and I think it was like the Dole Company or one of those companies was involved over there and helped taking it over because of, I think, pineapple later they wanted to control. But um, but we would later add Hawaii uh, and also Alaska as, you know, the last two states of the United States a little later. Uh, I've got a few minutes left. Let's talk about a few more things, and that's it. And I'll review later, not today on this section, but um, let me talk about a few more things that was also part of um, 
uh, America uh, kind of get involved in expansionism uh, as well. Um, yeah, they had some um, American expansions that became in the 1880s, uh, real, real popular uh, eventually. Uh, and uh, there are different theories on like what drove it, they think, like why people got involved in it. I'll talk about a few things real quick that was why it became popular. Uh, one was uh, the U.S. thought they were trying to kind of copy what the British were doing. Britain, you know, was trying to civilize the world by trying to colonize Africa, Asia, Pacific. They dubbed that white man's burden uh, from a poem by uh, Rudger Kipling. Kipling uh, and um, so they felt like the, their civilizations, their, their cultures, better than what's out there, Africa, Asia, uh, even though it probably isn't to, to those that they're pushing it on. Uh, but that was part of the reason that we felt like American civilization, culture, you know, we ought to, you know, expand it to the world. And so you have this guy named Josiah Strong. He was an American reverend, social reformer, wrote a book called Our Country, which came out in 1885. And it was one of the first books that really popularized the idea of expansionism, uh, you know, that we need to expand uh, throughout the world. Uh, and uh, he thought that, you know, it was up to us, the Americans, you know, as a people uh, to extend our culture to other people, Latin America. Africa, Asia, Pacific, because uh, we're, we're a better civilization than they are. Um, so it's kind of a one-sided racist view is what it was. Uh, and so, but it's like kind of similar to that white man's burden theory that was real popular. Uh, let me have this history professor at Harvard uh, named, you may have heard of him, Frederick Jackson Turner. He had this thesis called the, called the Turner thesis he came out with. And what the thesis basically said was that basically um, at the time the U.S. had frontiers, and that was part of what made the United States a great nation, was the fact we were always expanding on the frontier. Well, the frontier's gone, you know. Uh, and so he's saying that uh, if the frontier's gone, that what's going to happen, we don't expand, we'll become, ecsta we'll become an ex um, stagnant country. So we'll come, well, we, if we don't expand, we're going to become stagnant. You know, we got to do something here. Uh, and so that means expanding outside our borders to take over other parts of the world uh, to keep expanding, uh, basically. So anyway, that's who Frederick Jackson Turner was. And then one more I'll give you, too, before I go uh, that was also, uh, also popular uh, was Alfred T. Mahan. You see that book there. Uh, Mahan was a naval captain, U.S. naval captain. He published a book in 1890 called The Influence of, of Sea Power Upon History. Very important book when dealing with the idea of imperialism uh, and all of that. And what uh, Mahan argued was that basically all great nations, the ones that were powerful like Britain and so on, uh, Romans, whoever it was, always had real powerful naval forces. And he believed that the U.S. ought to develop a better naval force because he believed that our Navy had become stagnant uh, in the late 19th century. We hadn't really fought a war, a major war, since Civil War. So um, so he was concerned about that uh, in developing a na naval power. Uh, and so they believed that this book that he published, um, I think it came out in 1890 is when it came out. Yeah, 1890. Uh, and he believed that that book, um, of course, was influential in getting the U.S. Congress to pass legislation to develop a better naval force for our U.S. Navy, uh, which later led to the so-called White Squadron or Great White Squadron, uh, which eventually you see later, late 1890s, and also under Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt's administration. And uh, these will be the first big battleships that come out, like dreadnought battleships. Should be one word, battleships. But... Um, but that's something that you'll see later. So we'll become a big naval power of the United States by the 1900s. That Navy will keep expanding from World War I up to World War II. And I guess because of that book, you know, um, the U.S. is definitely the, per, per, the main, you know, naval power of the world. You got like, what, 10 or 11 aircraft carriers, which is kind of ridiculous, but we're, we're the big naval power, all because probably this book and other influences later. So...
that's pretty much it for lecture today on like um, on talking about like progressivism uh, and talking about imperialism. Um, of course, uh, I will be um, uploading this lecture later uh, to YouTube uh, after I finish it. Uh, if you have any questions about anything about this lecture, uh, let me know. Um, you know, you can um, take that off. You can, um, you know, send me a comment. Uh, or question uh, through the YouTube, not really through my YouTube channel when I get that video uploaded. Uh, if you got a question about something, maybe you get bonus points for asking comments, questions about the video uh, and all that. So let me know about that. And of course, don't forget, importantly, I told you uh, to start working uh, on your uh, online first exam uh, in quizzes. Uh, that is due next Tuesday. Uh, looks like uh, September the 29th, okay? So I think that's like your main assignment right now. I don't really have any other big assignments right now, but there'll be probably a Canvas quiz next week on the stuff we're lecturing about now, progressivism and imperialism uh, overall. So that's it for today. Uh, hope you all are safe out there. Take care. And I will uh, post another lecture, of course, on Thursday uh, as well to my YouTube channel. So you all take care. Have a good rest of the week.